Firstly, I'd like to introduce Louis Lancaster. Louis, I met on my UEFA A license in 2009. Um, and Louis actually came out to work with us in Dubai, um, came out to coach with us in Dubai. And I'll leave him just to, to describe what he, what he went and did before that and after that. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, well, firstly, thanks for having me, Chris. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my journey. Uh, I think talking about your journey can be a little bit difficult sometimes. So uh, I'm just going to lay it out as Arnold Schwarzenegger lines, lays it out. So he's got quite a good little formula. So I'm just going to nick that off him. Firstly, it was about when I was young, it was about vision. I was always passionate about football. I had the same electricity and feeling that I guess a lot of you have. Um, and I just wanted to be the best footballer I could be. And then it come to a point where I wasn't going to potentially get to that level. So I started coaching. My family were coaches. They ran a community football program. And I was part of that. So at 15, I started coaching. And then I thought to myself, when I'm 25, I'll be an expert coach. And then I got to 25 and realised I was way off the pace. And then I got to 35. And uh, again, still way off the pace. And I think the most important thing here is is that I'm never going to be that expert coach, but I'm enjoying the chase because every day I get better. That expert coach is always going to be 10 years ahead of me. So it's important to have someone to chase. Uh, I was always thinking big, uh, always thinking about the elite. I watch every single sport on TV, but I only watch it when it comes to the crunch. Um, I don't watch the heats in the 100 metres at the Olympics. I just watch the final. Snooker, I just watched the final, uh, Rugby World Cup, semi-final, final. So I was always thinking big and I just want to work with the best athletes in the world. I think in life, people will always say you can't do things. Uh, and I've got a pro licence, but my wife has also got a pro licence. She's contributed massively to what we're trying to achieve. And went to university, got my A licence. And then that was where I met Dick Bate. It was a who was a real influence in my football career, uh, a great man, one of the best I've met. And uh, for some reason, we just had a great relationship. We stayed in touch. And then he invited me to be one of 16 candidates to do the elite coaching license, uh, which was an incredible experience. I learned so much from other people. And then from there, I went on to my pro license. And then, look, as Arnold Schwarzenegger said, it's about working hard. Everyone's making sacrifices. You have to give as much as you can. So I was working in England. I then went to UAE, as Chris said. And then I got my big break. I went to China to work in professional football in League One. <clears throat> then I went to Taiwan to work with the international team. I was assistant coach there, then the head coach. And shortly I'll be off to America to join Utah Royals. And then, so this is how Arnold Schwarzenegger lays it out. His vision, thinking big, ignore the naysayers, work hard. And the last one is to give back. So I'm always taking time to give to schools, give to people, uh, give to webinars. I think it's really important. And that's my journey. Well, thank you, Arnold. That was very good of you. Um, <laughs> we've, uh, we've probably got about five minutes left of the webinar now. So we're, <laughs> we're uh, now. Thanks, Louis. Um, moving on to, to Colin Little. Uh, Carl, who uh, I, when I was a YTS, Carl come in as a, uh, as a player, being bought at, at crew and... Um, I'll let obviously Colin come on now and explain his experiences. Yes, Brownie. Um, mine similar to to Luke's before. Um, player never got to come by a club or played for Manny Boys. Got released. No real um, playing men's football. Had to then um, adapt and um, started to do well in men's football and ended up going to to, um, to crew. Uh, fifty thousand pound signing, seeing you there, everybody, <laughs> and uh, introduced to real good coaching, um, coaching that I couldn't, I would never have been a player unless I got that. Really, that's it. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, we shared in that, and obviously it's something very special that we're always, uh, and, and I'm sure you'll come on to that anyway when you, when we talk about it later. But um, and next, uh, Sean O'Shea, who I met many years ago in Dubai. Um, and we've been, you know, good friends ever since. And Mr. Mike Lawson, who I met through Sean um, uh, out here. And obviously, we've done some work together, coaching uh, the three of us, working with players. Um, and obviously, Sean and I working together as well, coaching. Um, so, yeah, I'll let you both go from there. 
Yeah, cheers, Brian. Well, if we start the most recent, and obviously we're both uh, working with the first team at AIK. Uh, Mike, I can go into detail. As a fitness coach myself, uh, second assistant coach. Uh, before that, I was in um, in Dubai for five years, like you say, Brownie, where we worked together and coached together. I was uh, head of football for a private um, training facility where I worked with a lot of players um, from all around the world, different levels, um, a lot of clubs as well, doing uh, training camps, which is where me and Mike met each other and started working together and that's where we kind of developed a bit of a re reputation for working with the individual players. Um, yeah, previously that was coaching in Norway, which is pretty much where I started uh, with under-19s. Went back to Huddersfield, coaching the academy there and then out to Dubai. So that's kind of my sort of coaching path the last uh, 10 years in terms of education. Uh, just doing the pro licence now with the FAI in Ireland. We just started that recently. Um, playing career was quite short. Played for Huddersfield Town in the youth and in the academy. Um, played a little bit lower league, Buxton and whatnot. But um, yeah, I turned to coaching pretty quickly at the age of about 21 and gone from there really and ended up where I am today. Nice one. Cheers, Sean. And yeah, I'm a little bit different. I've got a sports science background. So at the minute, the first team sports scientist at AIK. Um, and then before that, I was previously in Dubai with yourselves for... I was there for seven years at Al Ali Club, which uh, was great from that point of view. Like, obviously working at club level out there and also um, doing the individual stuff with, with Sean and yourself, Brownie, you know, developing that sort of side of the coaching as well. So, um, And then before that, I was just doing my undergrad at Northumbria uh, in sports science. And yeah, uh, not a very good football. I didn't... <laughs> didn't play at any sort of half decent level to uh, a good keeper. To come I was an alright keeper, <laughs> but uh, yeah, not good enough to uh, to certainly make it anyway. But but yeah, like I say, give it a little bit of a different sort of uh, background to to this sort of this webinar. So. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you, thank you, chaps. And um, what I mean, it's a little bit different this evening from what we've done previously. Obviously, we've only had one guest on at a time um, for the previous three webinars. But so the the format this evening is that. I'm going to ask all of you to um, you know, just basically speak about with regards to obviously developing the individual within a team environment. So whether that is where you're working at the moment or where you've worked previously and how you see you getting the most success out of that. Um, we'll start with, we'll start with Louis, um, go straight in it to it for you, obviously. I, I, and I'll just let you crack on after that. It'll be Colin, then it'll be Sean and Mike, and then we'll have a little discussion um, between one another. Cause I think there'll be a lot of crossovers. Um, for everyone, and then we'll open it up for questions from from uh, people viewing. All right, Lou. Okay, thank you, Chris. Okay, I think when you're working with uh, individual players, I think you know need to know three things. And the first thing you need to identify who you're actually working with. So obviously, when I look back at uh, Jaden's time, and I still talk to him regularly now, I don't actually talk to this player, I don't actually talk to Jaden himself. I think it's really important when you're talking to an individual to reach deep inside and talk to the person that actually fell in love with the game of football because that's where the passion is. Uh, and you need to know as much about this person as possible, their school life, their home life, because if, something's, if something changes, it can completely change everything, everything else. There are so many things in football we can measure we can measure passes, we can measure GPS, you know, how many runs they make. There's so many things we can measure, but I think it's really important that it's the things we can't measure that make the difference at the moment. And now the ABCs. So what is the, how much ambition does a player have? How much belief do they have? And how much courage do they have? Because if I go back to Jaden as a young boy, you know, he lived in the South of England, uh, away from his parents, then he moved from the south to the north of England in Manchester. And then he's gone from Manchester to Germany. And to do that at such a young age, I think, takes incredible courage. The next question is, once you identify who you're working with, what is their dream? And it's their dream. And I remember looking at Jaden from a young age. And he said, I want to play for one of Europe's top clubs. And he's doing that now and he's adding value. So that box is ticked. Then he also said he wants to represent his country. And the sole focus, everything that was driving that forward was for his family, he wanted them to be proud of him. Um, and knowing him as a person, how ambition he is, how much belief he's got in that courage, 
now those boxes are ticked. He's just it's a different caliber. Now, now they're ticked. He'll want to move on. I haven't spoke to him about it, but I bet it, deep inside he's got this in his sights. Whether he'll get it or not, I don't know. But I think that will be his next challenge. That's his next stepping stone. And I think this is where the coach comes in. How do you add to their game? And I think add is such a key word when working with players. Because you can say things like, uh, oh, Jaden, well done. That was brilliant. The effort you put back, you went around three players. But, and I think when you throw that word but in there, that young boy that you're trying to connect with is no longer listening. He's not present in the conversation. And we see it on all the reality shows. The judges will give good comments and good comments. And when they say but, all the audience starts booing where you can say exactly the same thing, just a different spin. You can say, well done, Jaden, great effort. You got back. That was fantastic. And I've noticed something we can add to your game. And now you say the word add, they're now listening. So add is a very, very key word. The four corner model. I mean, as I've got older, I've come to, this isn't nowhere near finished, but it's just my own little spin on the four corner model at the moment. And I think dead in the middle, is the ambition and the belief and the courage of the individual that drives everything forward the same with the sun you know the planets can't survive without the sun and i don't think the player can survive without that either they must have that drive that fuels everything and then you've obviously got to teach them the game you know uh like my son is six years of age he absolutely loves watching football on the tv but he doesn't like going to football practice because it's not the same and I agree with him, he's passing in pairs, you know, they're standing in queues. And at the end, if they're well behaved for the last 10 minutes, they'll get the game. But the game, that last 10 minutes is what he fell in love with. That's why he's there. So I think it's important to teach them the game. And then just my opinion, I think at the highest level, the player must be able to make decisions under reduced time. Uh, we're trying to develop better thinkers, so give them decisions to make. That, that's the difference. They must, the brain trumps everything. The next one, they must be able to handle the ball in a variety of different situations to play at the highest level. And the next one is, it'll be interesting what the sports science boys have to say about this, but um, you know, I, I'm big on power, relative power, not my power against your power, relative power. Um, so can they move themselves over two to five yards quicker than other people. And I think when you work with an, an individual, it, it's difficult uh, because you need to measure their contribution to a game. Because if they win a game of football, you could gloss it over and say that everybody played really well. Well, actually, I might have had the worst game of my life. Whereas if you lose a game of football 2-0, someone actually might have played out of their skin. You know, and here's just a little, little example. So if you look at little Billy here, he's a six out of 10 player. Joel's a nine out of 10 player. But in this one game at the weekend, Joel, uh, Joel might be performing to a seven out of 10. Billy might be playing out of his skin. He might be overperforming and he's playing out seven out of 10. But unfortunately, Billy will come off. But Billy's overplaying and Joel is underplaying. So it's a fine line. How do you measure... Uh, the contribution that a player is playing in. And this was something I was fascinated with when working at Watford, uh, really homing in the, on the individual. And I did a presentation about it called the me in team, which was about they, the player gets certain amount of points for where they pass, where they release the ball, where they receive it. So it's just about trying to get their contribution because anybody can play a game of football, but contributing to it is different. And then again, this is, a, this is a big question here. Do you develop the strength or the weakness? Um, and I know people go away and learn from different sports. I think that's so good and vital. And probably my biggest learning has come from table tennis. And I remember talking to someone about the top 100 table tennis players in the world. And they said rank 11 to 100 are 8 out of 10 across the board. That's forehand, backhand, spin, serve. Everything is 8 out of 10. However, that is not enough to break into the top 10 in the world. And the people that are in the top 10 of the world have a weapon. They have a signature move that can really hurt you. So someone might have a 10 out of 10 serve, a 10 out of 10 spin, but then all the others might be six out of 10. But they have that weapon. And when you're working with a player, it's a fine line. 
do you develop the strength or the weakness? And for Jaden, it was about scoring goals, creating goals and playing forward. We did absolutely no defending whatsoever. Uh, and it's a pleasure to see him play for Borussia Dortmund now in England. And he's tracking runners. He's getting into pockets of space and he's, he's getting goal side, ball side. So it will come. Um, I'm sure there's other stories where he did develop the strengths and it wasn't enough. But that's just a, a, a good question, I find. So that's how you add to the game. Uh, sorry, you go through everything. Identify who you're working with. What's the dream? What do you need to add? And the big question is how? So for me, learning is, it has to be fun. Every session has to be fun. And I think the way to do that is going back to what my son says. It has to be realistic. Let them play the game. That's what they fell in love with. You know, and they need to leave training disappointed that it's over and they cannot wait to come back to the next session. Um, it's got to be challenging. And uh, I, I don't know if anyone's been watching a bit of Michael Jordan at the moment, but it really interesting. In his contract, he was the only player in the NBA to have a clause in his contract that he could still play street basketball whenever he liked. And I thought that was so beautiful because he's got that desire and hunger of street games and he never wants that taken away from him. And I think that's what training's got to be like. They have to love the game and they, it has to be enjoyable. So with learning comes fun, also comes challenges. And I think as kids uh, of today and what we did as kids, we will invest huge and huge amounts of time playing computer games. We will miss sleep, miss dinners. And the reason we'll play computer games is because the game will provide us a challenge. We'll complete level one, level two, level three. And then when we get to a level we're stuck at, we'll invest that time. And when we complete that game, we will never play it again. And the reason we won't play that game again is because it can no longer provide a challenge. And I think as a coach, when you're coaching players, you have to be a game of infinite levels because if the player can complete you, you are finished. You can no longer help that player. And a few ways how I tried to challenge Jaden was, you know, if you've got 12 players, why go 6v6? Why can't you go 8v4? Why can't you go 7v5? He always relished the challenges. Um, you can challenge, challenge players mentally. I remember having two teams of, I don't know, 8v8, whatever it was, and two players on one team, they had to praise all their teammates for everything that they did. Even if the ball rolled under their foot, it was well done, keep your head up, that was amazing. Where on the other team, I set up two players to really get on players' backs. Even if it was a good bit of good play, good decision, it was that wasn't good enough, work harder. And, and it, you could see the difference between the teams. And that was something Jaden really struggled with at the time. Uh, another challenge for Jaden was, you know, get someone to man mark him in training. It was un under 15. And in training, we're getting someone to man mark him. It was difficult. He got frustrated. But that's the game. That's what's going to happen in the future. That's what we're trying to prepare players for. And if you think about it, the environment in an academy is quite soft to the, compared to the environment kids make for each other on the streets. You know, Jaden was telling me stories before on the streets, you know, you don't want to be last picked. If you kick the ball off the pitch, there's four players waiting on the side. So if you make a mistake, you've got to run off the pitch, join the queue, someone else comes on. If you lose a game, you get a punch in the arm. So the environment kids create is so, so ruthless. And I think the street football has helped him, which has developed that challenge. And also part of learning is questioning. You need to ask them who, what, when, where, and why, and how. And there's two types of question. You can ask a simple question, where's the space? Um, but then you've got the complex questions is, what do you need from me to attack this space? Uh, what can we do in this situation to really hurt the opposition? And the relationship I had with Jaden took a long time to get to that questioning process. Because every time I spoke to him, after 10 seconds, his body was there, but his spirit and soul had left. He wasn't even listening. So I made a, a thing to myself that I could only talk to him for 10 seconds at a time. And every 10 seconds had to be positive. So it was Jaden, that was a great pass. You've got to show me that, off you go. Next time, Jaden, that was incredible. I can't believe you just did that, off you go. And then funnily enough, what happened after about a month, he started coming to me. So I just upped my game from 10 seconds to 20 seconds. And it was, this was brilliant. This is what we can add. I've noticed something we, that can help. That was amazing. Off you go. Uh, I'm not saying that'll work for everybody, but it's certainly worked in our relationship. I think the next thing is your session structure. Um, 
my first ever driving lesson was on the road. And the road is the most hostile, stressful environment you can be. And that was where the first driving lesson was. And then what the driving instructor will do, if you're struggling uh, with anything, he will reduce the stress and he'll put you in a car park because there's no other cars. So if you can't pass, I don't know, do a parallel parking or reverse parking, he'll take you there. And once you develop the skills and you're competent, he will put you back onto the road. Where I think in football, we do it the other way around. We start players in the car park. And because there's no challenge, because half of them could already do it, it's not fun. We kind of lose them a little bit. So I'm a big believer in put them in the hostile environment, then take them out individually into this car park. So you could play 10 v 10. You've got 20 players and potentially that's 20 different needs. Uh, and if you're really talking about individual development and you want to tailor make it to the individual, after two minutes, you could just take out one player and work on his heading. So that game now becomes 10 v 9. Everyone's in a hostile environment. They're in that pitch and you're working in the car park with one player. That player then goes back from the car park to the road. You can marry up the challenges. So you've got a left back in there who needs to prevent crosses, and you've got a right winger in there that needs to produce crosses. So just pull them out, and then you can work with them two together so it's a real challenge. Um, I remember one with Jaden. It was, look, I pulled him out. You've got to score five in a row. You know, you've got to score five goals in a row. You score five in a row, you can go back into the game. Boom, 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 straight back in. Whereas if, because he wanted the game. And if you take them after training and say score five, if you don't say score five in a row, they won't. Some will go in the top corner, some will go in the car park. So it was all about keeping that competitive edge. I think it's important with a session structure, you, you get to know the individual and that will tell you how much challenge and success you can give them. So for a player like Jaden, uh, it was just full on challenge all the way. Some people need a little bit of success and then a little bit of challenge. And I think knowing the individual determines the ratios. And they could have had a bad day at school. They might have had a row with their mum and dad. And the ratios are constantly changing. Uh, however, I, th I think that's really important. And th this is one of, one of the things I tried to change. So every player has a target. And whatever the target is, it's theirs. So you've got three types of player in the academy. You've got your strivers, your copers, and your strugglers. And with your strivers, I think it's important to give them a target that will help their game. So for Jaden's, it was score, create, play forward with a style of possession that will hurt someone. Then you've got the players you're not sure about, your copers. You're not sure if they're going to fade away or come good. Um, and with those players, I think, again, it's important to give themselves a target that will help their game. And this is just part of the process. It's not me being horrible. Some players are just not going to make it. Uh, and I think instead of giving those players a target they're going to help themselves, give them their, those players a target to help the best players. So, for instance, if Jaden's going to get on the ball when he's playing in a number 10 position and your right winger is one of those players who's really, really struggling, just give him a target to help Jaden and say, look, when anyone gets the ball, show feet. When Jaden gets it, run in behind. So now when your best player, Jaden, has got the ball who you're trying to develop, he's got forward passing options. So you can really cleverly link all the targets geared around your one or two best players in your group. Right. <clears throat> I've just got challenges. And then these are just some of the challenges you're going to face. Some clubs might want to, you know, employ an individual elite developer. Some clubs won't. But I think it's important to get a real, a real buy-in. And I think when you're in that role, you've got to understand the difference between sport for all and sport for the elite. Another one is things change. As I said, they could have had a really bad day at school. Uh, they might just have got a newborn brother and they're not sleeping for the next month. So it's important to review the process. So things can change. Keep it about the player. I think it's only natural for some players to say, oh, it's not my fault, it's his fault, it's his fault. I think it's no blames and they've got to take personal responsibility. And one, things I, one of the things I like to live by is never lose twice in a day. It's okay to lose a game of football, that's fine, but you can never lose to yourself. Don't interfere. I think uh, at Watford, we had a good system. Every player, the club had a duty of care. Every player had access to the physio, they had access to the sports scientist, the psychologist. 
and, and every team had a head coach and an, uh, an assistant coach. I didn't want to go in and start interfering with them sessions. So I was kind of preparing the coaches and saying, look, what's your topic? What are you going to work with? I will just come in. I'll literally be a ghost. You won't see me. And I will just talk to the few players. It could be that when they're playing 11 v 11, the coaches are working on playing out from the back. But I would be in that session as a ghost, invisible. And I would just be talking to a few players. How many players around you? Checking your shoulders, blah, blah, blah. So I wasn't interfering. I think that could be a, a real difficult situation. Sometimes this happens. Uh, I felt it a little bit because if you are an elite individual developer, you're obviously working with the, the very best that you have and others are working with the, the team. And I think you can be seen as, oh, he's working with this. So you've got to tread that line very carefully. And then the last one, just to sum it all up, is about teammates. So from the academy environment, I went to China and then to Taiwan uh, in the first team environment. And I think when you have got maverick type players, I think as long as they are adding value to the team, they will be accepted. So Jaden was always adding value. Uh, we had a player called Biro Biro, who was Brazilian in China, incredible player. Um, but he was always adding value. He was scoring goals. And I think when you're working with players, I think you need to talk to the maverick about the maverick. Say you can win us the game. Uh, and then you need to talk to the team about the maverick. And you need to say, look, they're not going to trap back as much. Defensively, they're not going to do this. But you need to sell it to them that actually he can win us the game. And I think they'll buy into that. However, that, it, that buy-in will start to fade when they don't produce. And we had a similar situation in Taiwan. We had a fantastic player, uh, great personality, hardworking, uh, wanted that kind of maverick status on the pitch, but didn't produce. And because he didn't produce, it was difficult to be accepted. So that's the presentation. They're the three questions again. Thank you for listening. I look forward to your questions. Cheers, Louis. Thanks a lot for that. Um, obviously, great detail, great depth to that for everyone. Um, I'll pass, go straight on to Carmen. I mean, like Louis was obviously talking about the work he's done at the lower uh, ages of the development age group. So I'll pass now on to, to Colin Little, obviously working with the 18s and um, at Man United. Cheers, Carl. Oh, cheers, mate. Good that Louis um, covered quite a lot, really. Um, I wanted to talk more about um, the details within um, helping an individual. So for instance, I was a professional when I, when I landed with you, Brownie, uh, as a 22, 23 year old. And, and, you know, you're still learning then. And the coaching I got there really influenced me now about it's, it's not all them things that Louis saying, which is a great, I didn't enjoy it every day. It wasn't, it wasn't fun. It was really high level detailed coaching of Stevie Holland or Dario, if you like, that because they knew exactly what to say and it's not it's not like um, talking about just the whole thing it's like learning you how to back in learning you how to so you have your, your your coaching for the week how's your week look that's what I always wanted to talk about so I'm with the 18s at the moment we've got to try and win a game of football at the end of the week you've got to prepare for the opposition you've got to look at the within that there might be a Jordan Sancho who you, what, what Louis said and identified quite well is what does that player need so within your structure you might have 20 odd players two coaches maybe and you've got to try and find what an individual player needs to improve him like what happened to me so I, I got clearly influenced by that as I'm sure you did Brownie and everybody who ever was in that that, that uh, environment it's high level coaching with people who know exactly what you're doing it's not it's not just any old coach following procedure and making it fun and making it good and recognising he's a good player, which is absolutely brilliant. And so what, it's collectively, what's he going to need now? So what's Brownie going to need? Well, he's going to need to be able to defend 1v1. So, so when you're doing your normal possessions, and some, you have to find the time to grab Brownie on his own and say, well, there might be two or three of them say, right, Brownie, we're going to need you to do better with your foot patterns and your 1v1s. We're identifying it, we're doing something about it, and we've got the coaches with the know-how to do something about it. But that's going on at... at, at at our place all the time at the moment and you've got to be looking at if the, how many players you've got what's the week look like so Monday it might be recovery so there's not much you can actually do about that because um, you can't do too much with them but you could split off into some groups that day Tuesday it might be a bit more of a physical day where you've got to 
maybe some possessions, some stuff to learn in the whole game. So you've got, you've got to make sure you're getting everything in there, aren't you? The tactical side of the game, the trying to improve players, trying to make a, win a game at the end of the week, the game prep. All these things have to be taken into consideration. I, I know I haven't got a PowerPoint, but I'm just concentrating on that bit, really. What, what would it look like with 20 players to improve them 20 players? Like, like what happened to me and you, Brown, if you like. So I felt I could see... After I left crew and I went and played for several other clubs, I didn't go into my coaching, but Mansfield, Maxfield and Halifax and other clubs, I just felt we trained. And I'm sure Seth said the same the other day. We top, top managers, top managers, and they're saying, we didn't do any of that. We didn't do any coaching to improve players. Now, it's not always fun. In fact, it's quite demanding on the players. So when I left crew, I was just quite happy to go and play and play with some freedom at other places. Like what Louis said, and enjoy myself. But it didn't make me any better. I was, I was 29 when I left. It didn't make me any better. And I could see young players at these other clubs. And I'm like, he needed to get what I was getting. If he'd have got what I'd got, he'd have been a better player than me. So I think I maximised what I did. Because the coaches got the best out of me. And it, it was nothing to do with being friendly with the coaches. He wasn't my friend. They were just like teachers, but very good teachers. And they knew what they were doing. And I, I get... I get exactly what Lou is saying now. I, I'm a coach at the moment with the 18s and I, I'm making sure that it's much, much easier for the coaches, for the players to, to do stuff and learn stuff. If they like you, you know, if they don't like you, and you're, you know, we've all had them coaches who are screaming and shouting and doing these things and if they step out of line, you have to tell them. But if they don't like you, there's a barrier there straight away. And, it, you know, and you have to find ways of being able to communicate with them, being able to... Not, not letting them get away with things, but being able to be... To, and, and you want to know that my ambition was after the left air, I want to be really good at what the coaches were good at helping me. That's, what, that's the type of coach I want to be. I don't want to be the friend of them all. I don't want to be the number two who's having a laugh and a joke with him. I, I want to be the guy who, who I can look back and actually think of the things, each part of the game that I got better at because the coach helped me get better at that. I can remember the words he was saying to me that helped me get better at it. Not generic stuff like like um, stop the cross or hit the target. They all try to hit the target. They don't try to miss unless they've got a bet on that they're going to lose the game, you know. It, it, all the generic stuff you hear, that isn't coaching to me. The coaching is the details. They're getting better at it. Where's your standing foot? And with all the, and the guys who will come on next, so I'm sure they'll say that, that that's what my obsession is. And the players really buy into it because the, and the analysis side of the game now is so good. Straight after training, you go into a room with him, you show him the clips of the foot patterns when he was defending 1v1, the way he arranges his body to finish a chance off. You know, as he, you can show him that it's not quite right, his shape isn't right as he hits the ball and show him some good ones and then say, right. And then during the next week's training, take him on their own, do some individual work on that particular thing, get 20 repetitions of that shot and really hit that particular incident and I just feel so passionately about how that works because it certainly worked for me and I've seen it work for countless players who come through that crew system. Like you say, you were, you were all influenced by that because they're all managing now or everywhere else, you know, with Critch and mm. Tate here who I'm coming up against all the time and the rest of them and so many, Phil Charlotte, everybody else is in the, in the game. And I think when you've been when you've been affected by that kind of coaching and it influences you, you've seen it and experienced it, that's to me, and I've been on all the courses and Dick Bate, brilliant, all them people. I still think we were very lucky to have been through what we went through. And then I turned up at Man United, which was uh, absolutely unbelievable, with Paul McGuinnesses and Jim Ryans, and, and then you see what they're doing. And if you can take a bit of what, sometimes they played with so much expression and freedom at United, we were very restricted, I felt, at crew, very regimented, but it had a really, a really good effect on And sometimes I think a balance between all of that, you know, I sometimes think what would, what would Dino have been like if he was a bit more, you know, he might be listening to this or he might be on that What would he have been like if he was they play with some more freedom, like the Marcuses and that, and then you put that regimented things in a bit more. So there's a place for it all, and where does it all fit in? And when it does fit in, it's like, wow, you know, I'm sure these players would all get through and be good players anyway. But if if you can give them what they got a crew as well, there's nothing to say they wouldn't have been even better players, if you know what I mean. And most of the places have been after that. And I ask all the other coaches, 
it wasn't really talking in them details on, you know what I'm talking about there, because you experienced it with Stephen. You could come off a training session, it was like, it was like being in a, a lecture and you come off and you feel like you've learned at the end of that training session, not, not just trained if you like, you know? And how do you fit that in, in a, in a week? I'm, I'd be interested in how the guys do that or when Louis talks about it, it, it's Chinese club or, you know, we, we, we're always striving and looking to ways to fit individual work in and, you know, that, that's my take on it because we know we have to do game prep. We know we have to do some shape. We know we have to do some, some um, tactical work, but where do you fit that in? The bit that I think we're all always on about small gains, big gains. You get big gains from that. So that's my take on it, and not a presentation, but you know, a, a bit of a debate with the, with the lads like that. Yeah. I mean, it, brilliant. Thanks, Carl. I mean, see, we coming from that background with, with Dario and Steve Holland, and um, being very fortunate to have come through that coaching where they, they really care about the improvement of the players. Um, I mean, you, you've obviously got the, the best of the best there at Man United in terms of sports science, um, you know, the analytical side, how the game's moved on so much. And how do you integrate that with the, the, the real the coaching that you've experienced to, with the individual players? Oh, it's helped us so much. I mean, there's some fantastic analysts there, but uh, they, they're almost like another coach. You know, them days are gone when you look at sports science and think they can't help you, they can help you. I mean, they're so good now. They can, as long as he spends some time with the coach, they can actually go with the player on his own and show him the clips straight after training. And he's so integrated. And the sports science guys, the strength and conditioning guys, are doing doing the work. Say you're showing him some foot patterns or some, say it's a forward and he's trying to spin in behind, and you're showing the foot patterns. The strength and conditioning guys will do their their little spin work with a little a little spin and a turn, you know, and. Um, so it's all it's all um, so so integrated that it's like you, you don't want to, you you want them around you when you're helping the lads because they, it just becomes a team and the players then become part of that team and they, they they just really buy into it. It's been a godsend. I mean, I don't think you can get to the levels you can get to without that kind of help or, 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 unless you've got a student who's just who wants to who's so good because when you actually show them, it's so powerful. You know, they, sometimes after the game, you can say, it, oh, you should have done this and that. It's, they forgot about it 20 minutes later. Oh, yeah, and like so, but now you can clip it, go back on the Monday, show it them again, and the guys help you. And, it, and then it, it's just so powerful. And I think it, it, you get so much from it. It's big gains all the time. Yeah. I, I mean, you mentioned the time quite a few times in that. Um, yeah. And it, it is for everyone, isn't it? You're working, if you're working in a club, you only have so much time to, to work with the players. And particularly if you're working, if you're playing Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday. So how do you, and you know, if we're looking at working and developing the, the individual, how do you decide what you work on? Because there are so many things that you can bring in. You can, you know, loads of different things that you yeah. can try to improve a player. But how do you individually decide, right, this is what I'm going to do this week to improve that player? Well, you have a, a team of, like you say, analysts, coaches, play care, everybody. And you see what fits in in the week. We had a discussion on it yesterday, actually, because we, we, we're saying we, we make, must make some room for some freedom for the lads, some free play and some not such much, not so much coaching. But I used to call them, I call them this now because because the crew, I never called them at the time, but there's some days where they just don't need to be thinking too much about it. And it's a freedom day. I felt that crew, we were constantly always thinking about it. Mm. And I think it would be too much at times. And under Louis van Gaal at United, the, the first team players used to be saying, that's what it was like. They didn't ever have a chance to like just play free and let the shackles off, if you like. And, and that could stifle, especially in development, stifle um, individuality. And, and uh, you don't want to do that. Definitely not. So we always make sure there's some room in there. But just period, what's it, period, periodization of the week. I can't say it. I got it wrong yesterday. How do you fit that in? So some fun on some days, like what, well, even... The first team players want fun. You're right. It doesn't always have to be fun. It can't always be fun, but they want some fun some days. They want some days when it's a real thinking day and it might be learning the three at the back and wing backs and it's like they need to concentrate and learn. So if, if you like that all the time, I don't think it's good for development. It's, you know, I know because I went through it myself. So you have to try and, as a group of people, think, and, and you, if you am the number two, so if the number one, right now is a great coach, you're saying, we should do this. I can sometimes, well, I think that might be a bit too much this week. And he, 
he could say, well, I don't know, I think it'd be right. And you go, okay, and it's right. You, you just have, a, have your say. And as a group of people, you're trusted. You, the, the, the head guy makes the decision at the end, but, you know, and hopefully you've got the experience to know one and he trusts you on and that's it, really, you know? Yeah, brilliant. All right, thanks, Carl. Appreciate that, mate. And we'll come back, obviously, in. Um, Sean and Mike, obviously, working with the first team at AIK. Um, so if you can, uh, you can just let everyone know what you're doing um, over in Sweden. Yeah, so what we'll do then, we'll, um, we'll, we'll show this presentation now and we'll switch between um, me and Mike to kind of highlight how we integrate, uh, how we, uh, integrate the, the coaching with the, with the sports science side of things. Um, so we'll just, we'll just go across each other a little bit. So uh, we'll look at uh, training methodology um, and where the opportunities are you know, within the first team environment week to week to uh, conduct individual training sessions. Uh, how we identify the areas for individual development, where they come from, uh, and how we integrate the physical data to structure the individual sessions. And I'll just finish off um, where we'll have a look at some example sessions or case studies that we've done with individual players, whether it be single session or a uh, multiple session. Okay, so just to sort of um, expand on a little bit what you were saying there, Colin, you know, where does it all fit in? Mm -hmm. Well, I think first of all, certainly at AIK, we have to look at you know, what does our normal training week look like from a team's perspective? And then where can we fit in extra individual sessions with the players? So if we were just looking at our week on a Saturday to Saturday basis, which is very rare over here because we, we usually play Saturday, Wednesday, and then we've got nine days before another game. But if we're just going hypothetically from a Saturday to Saturday, we'll have, you know, your first two days, like recovery, can't do too much there with the lads that have played. Then we've got like a, a conditioning block where we'll have like an intensive day, which will be all based around small spaces, small sided games from 3v3s to 5v5s, which, you know, from a physical point of view, is going to develop them in a certain way. You know, lots of accelerations, decelerations, lots of short sprints. And then we move on to an extensive day where, again, physically it's a little bit different, where we're working in bigger spaces longer duration, you know, and that can be anywhere from 8v8 up to 11v11, could be transitional drills, you know, so from that point of view, you're getting lots of high speed running, you get a large amount of distance in the players. And then, and then we'll move into our sort of match prep, two days of a speed day and activation day, and they will depend on exactly what the, you know, the coach has got in mind from a tactical point of view, what he wants to work on. But on an overall perspective, we're not loading them too much. So to make sure that they're fresh going into that game, which ultimately at first team level is the most important thing. You know, we've got to get results and that involves the players being 100% fresh for those days. Um, so then when we're starting to look at, you know, what individual training can we do and where we can fit it in, now it's going to be a little bit different for the players that are starting the games, the ones that are, clocking up the minutes to the ones that actually aren't. So typically if you're a starter, you know, you need those two days recovery. So we're not going to give you too much extra to do or too heavy work to do. So you're looking sort of in that conditioning block, you know, can you do that in those two days? And then ideally as well, maybe you could do it also a little bit on a Thursday if you're, if you're a little bit low from what the, the team were doing on, on that conditioning block. But, Ideally, you want them players to be going fresh into that game. But for your, for your non-starters and your squad players and your younger players, then, yeah, you've got more opportunity there to, to really develop them. So you could do that the day after the game, do that on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday always. But again, you perhaps ease off on it a little bit on the Friday to make sure that if they're called upon for the game, that they're ready 100% and, and fresh. Uh, so if you just carry that on then, um, and then how we actually identify individual development areas, you know, even though we, <laughs> you're working with senior pros and international players, they still have areas for development. Um, so we just go through this document that we have here. Is we, we created a profile player document on every single player in the first team um, where we highlighted what we thought their key skills were and their areas for development. Um, and that's from all the coaching staff. So it might be what the manager sees in a game and how he feels a particular player is playing at the minute. Uh, it could be things we see in training. And it's also things we sit down with the players quite regularly and talk to them and try and get their feedback and try and make them part of the process. If there's things they want to work on, 
they're a little bit frustrated with parts of the game, then you know we'll take them at the times that we can or that Michael allow for us to do uh, to work with those. So for the more experienced players, you know, it's about refining their, their key skills. Really, you know, we've got some players who are experienced, who've played in the top leagues in the world. You know, they're still international players and they're 30 plus years old. So for them, we kind of focus on just refining their key skills, what they're good at, and making sure they continue to be good at those. With the young players that come in, it's more about focusing on the development of their whole game. So whether that's the tactical part or the, the technical part, how, learning how we play. You know, we've just changed system now. So for players coming into the club, it's about learning how we play this new system. Um, and like I say, it's an evolving document, so it changes. You know, if we feel that we've worked with crossing, for example, one player and he's become quite accomplished at that, that becomes one of his key skills and we'll refine it. But then there might be something new that we've noticed about that player that we need to work on and we'll add that to this uh, player profile document. Um, and then what we do is, you know, we, when we identify what we'd like to work on, or I would like to work on with those players, it's about when we can do that. So we link the physical needs of the player with the uh, technical and tactical areas to try and marry the whole thing up so there's no kind of uh, crossovers and there's no risk of uh, injuries or having the players not fresh for, for the games, like Mike said. Yeah, and just to expand on that a little bit, you know, the how do we do that from a physical point of view and how do we sort of look at the sessions and how do we structure them. Obviously, we use data and not going too much into all the numbers. I just understand this is a coaching webinar, not a sports science one. But basically, yeah, we'll, we'll have scores for each players of what they've done over the last week and the last month and, you know, how much intensive work have they done, how much extensive work have they done. And, yeah, we'll, we'll sort of look at that, analyse it and understand, right, OK, this certain player needs a bit more extensive work, needs some high-speed running. So, you know, can we go and design a session based around that with also the technical and tactical things that he wants to work on and use those individual drills as well as top-ups from a physical point of view. So we're keeping everybody sort of developing from, from all aspects, but obviously as well, they're not going to go and get injured and do too much of a certain type of, uh, you know, training from a physical point of view because... Like I say, making all the players available for that Saturday game is the most important thing. So we've got to be on top of that and making sure that, you know, um, no one gets injured pretty much. So, and then just to finish off, then just an overview of types of sessions you might do. Um, if we look at this first one, just as an example, it's, it's doing an individual session with a single player. Um, so I might have gone to Mike and said, look, I want to work with this player on his finishing. And Mike might say, well, I've been looking at his individual load and he needs to work on his uh, intensive uh, aspect of his physical side. So then we come up with a session and this is just an over overview of what, what we've done. Uh, it's quite straightforward, really. The, the striker's working on his finishing and, you know, tactically we try and work on getting the ball into our midfields or into the strikers out wide. Then we look to deliver a whipped cross early. So the striker there starts centrally and he, he makes a sprint to the near post, receives a cross, tries to finish and then the player will come back around where he started and, and go out the other side and receive a cross from the other side. And that, that gets him that intensive work that Mike's looking for from a physical point of view. It gets him working on the types of finishes that he's going to get in a game. Um, so that, that marries the, the technical and tactical side with the physical. Um, and then, you know, you can be a little bit clever with it. So if, you, if you're lucky enough to be able to get time with a few players, then put one together here where there's three different players so we're working on the individual aspects of their game but put it into a session together so we've got a central midfield wants to work on receiving turning and passing the right wing back wants to work on his crossing and the striker as we just said in the first uh, instance there is working on his finishing but we're looking at the right back wants to work needs to work on the um, extensive from a physical point of view so he's getting the longer sprints before he delivers a cross uh, central midfielder and the strike is intensive but they're still working on the technical and tactical side so it's ball into the central midfielder he's linking up with the centre forward before we get the ball out wide where you get your high speed run from your full back who delivers the cross for the striker to finish so that's sort of two examples of how we might work with a single player or with multiple players but still getting that individual uh, work out for each player um, I think Cole made a good point then about you know players actually you know, it's important that they like you and that they buy into what you're doing because sometimes we've had examples of trying to do extra work with players, especially at the first team level. And 
sometimes they see it as a punishment or it's a bit embarrassing if you pull them after a session saying, listen, we need to work on how you're receiving the ball. You know, they don't want other players sometimes seeing them do that. So it's about explaining to them why we're doing it and that's why we involve them in the process of what do they want to work on as a player so we get that buy-in from them. Mm. Um, and it's just finding the right time then to be able to do it. And, you know, like Mike said, sometimes we do it after training uh, straight away. It might just take 10 minutes. Uh, it could be players who are coming back from injury and we're working on particular parts of their game. Or we well, might... Environment, I think, it, that, uh, it, like you said there, I do all them things and I always make sure the sports science guys have input on the mm. right environment. If you're doing it as a one-off, they're like, what am I doing here? Everybody's looking what when it's when it just becomes a norm, they start asking you for to do it. You know, I'm sure they come and ask you to to do some extra with them sometimes without you even asking yeah. them. Yes, yeah, just... exactly. Yeah, and we will sit down with them as well. We we, we sort yeah. of did a similar presentation to this to them and explain that you know you can either you know just, yeah. just run in if you want. You know, would you rather run you or would you rather do something with a ball? And obviously they're always going to choose a ball. So yeah. I think they understand the reason behind it and that. You know, we try and push the physical side in it as well, just to, you know, so they don't have that sort of... Like, if you sat down as a group as well, with the coaches and all the analysts, and actually identify so that striker might be, say, work on his near post runs and his connection, his contact. And then when you actually go and do that work with him then, it's even in linked into the, everything. And if you show him some clips of him not doing it so well, and then show him the training clips. We, we get little stories now, uh, so powerful. That we'll get little stories of maybe say you might miss a chance at that near post base then you go and do, take him away identify it show it him do mm. some work with it. and then when he scores some goals in training at it and then he scores a goal in a game you put the story together and they're like they, they, they absolutely love it you know what I mean it's like wow that works really working for me it's a bit kidology sometimes but also he's getting his fitness work in there he's getting everything in there you know what I mean yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah and then just the last part that was then with the goalkeeper coach you know we you always talk about when you go on coaching courses and we forget about the keepers sometimes. So what we try to do with the individual stuff is talk to the goalkeeper coach and say, look, is there any particular stuff that you want to work on with the keepers and try and involve them with it as well. So you, sometimes you might get four, five, six players and you get some good patterns going. Everyone's getting something out of it, but they're working together as well, which adds to that kind of, you know, building that env- the right environment for them to do it in. Thanks, chaps. Um, one thing I up with us is how, when you're... When you first went into the club, um, and probably more so for you, Sean, because you know from a sports science angle, you, you, uh, you you've gone in differently, Mike. Really, but the where you mentioned there about the kind of um, uh, apprehension around players being doing extra work. How I mean, how long and how did you have to build them relationships to so that so they understood that they're not? It's not actually you know a bad thing. This is a good thing we're doing for you. Um, it, you know, it varied, it varied. I think the, the key to it was getting the most respected players in the group to do it. And then once you got that, everyone kind of followed suit a little bit. So we were lucky enough that two or three of the players, like Sebastian Larson, for example, another lad called Anton Seletros, who, who, who's moved on from us now, they're, they're always really keen to, to work on different parts of their game. So it was good that we had the opportunity, or I had the opportunity, to take them after sessions in front of the players and work on stuff. Because, like I said, when the rest of the players saw that, when I then went to approach them, it made it a lot easier because they'd seen some of the more senior pros do it. So that, that was good. It's kind of those in-between players that, that, to be honest with you, the players who found most resistant to it are the ones that weren't playing. The young players are so eager to learn that they'll do anything you ask them to do. The senior players, they know that they need to work on certain aspects of the game to stay at, at the top or to, to progress. I found, really, it was the players who aren't playing who've probably got the hump a little bit that don't want to do the extra work because they're not playing. But... Is trying then with them to explain to them, look, if your future doesn't like this football club, you still need to impress when you get the chance to go somewhere else. So it was trying to sell it to them in, in that way that we still need to take care of you because if there's injuries or suspensions and you come in and play, you need to be ready to play. Yeah. So we need to make sure that physically, from Mike's point of view, that they were ready to go in. Otherwise, that leads to injuries and poor performance. And from my point of view, is make sure we do the best we can for the players because whilst at the club, that you know they're, they're important and we need to take care of them as much as, much as everybody else. Yeah, and Mike, what the the first slide that you you showed us was um, your your week. Now, where's that where's that been developed from? Is that your time at uh, Shabab Al Ali, or is that where's that come from? Uh, no, to be honest, it's, it's I love to take uh, credit for it. Now, it's a, it's a quite well known sort of um, like model of planning the week. It's called tactical periodization. I think yeah. it was 
he was born in Portugal, but I actually worked with a coach, uh, Carlos Cavallo. You know, he was at Swansea. He was in, he was at Alali for a short period of time. Um, and yeah, he's he's the one that sort of opened my eyes to that. He's just got he's just got a job. Has he gone to Brazil? He's got one of the big clubs in Brazil, I think. Or oh, he's just about the next job. Um, and he was he was the one who who, who brought that to Chibabalali, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was actually funnily enough, he was in the he, he got brought in as the head of the academy. Um, but in the, in the time, I did quite a bit of work with, also with the academy. So yeah, got to sit down and and his assistant as well with a guy called Bruno Lage as well, and he's. Um, He's now the manager of Benfica, so uh, these are people that have sort of tried and tested the model and, and sort of really opened up my eyes to to working in a different way, you know, trying to maximise the football-specific type of uh, fitness work, really, which, you know, it's, it's, it's dead easy just to run players, you know, but yeah. try and be creative and, and try and get the buy-in from them by... Uh, you know, working football specific ways is much better. Even even so, after the games, like what we've been doing now, mm. now typically they just get run for twenty minutes. But where we can and where we're allowed, you know, we'll get the cones out. We'll do possessions. We'll do, you know, um, small sided games if we've got enough players. That's where, uh, like Brownie said before, if if times of the essence and you can't fit things in, why just run on their own? Why not run and? incorporate some of the things that they need to get better at and some of the things that exactly, you know, yeah. and then you know, not having to cram everything in as much. Mm. Mm. And it's, you know, once, you, once you get a bit of a, you know, like a catalogue of drills, it's quite easy, you know, it just takes a little bit of planning time in terms of... A little bit of imagination now and again, that's why sometimes, like I only said before, most teams, even first teams, you're carrying 20 players, not all of them, 14 are going to be involved on the Saturday. Yeah, exactly. mm. are going to be involved. If on the Saturday morning you just take them on running, they know that that day is like they're just down for that day. I make sure that the, the, the lads who are not going to play on the Saturday will make sure we come in as coaches and we won't leave it to the sports science guys. We'll do it all together again because they're important. Mm. We want to make sure that we care about them and that, that's sort of another buy in where they, they realise you're actually giving them a go. And then the environment changes, they look forward to the Saturday morning session if they're not involved in the game because it's more individual time where they can hit them things that we're talking about before it's a key day for the ones who aren't playing on the Saturday because mm. they're getting proper time with the coach and they might play on the Wednesday and the ones who don't play on the Saturday then become players on the Wednesday that you have to spend more time with so it's, it's being creative with that time isn't it? Like, we, find- yeah, we, we, we kind of flipped it a little bit and I'm not saying it'll work for everyone but say you like play a 6v6 game and the losers have to do a few runs uh, we flipped it and said the winners have got to do runs. And then I, I just threw it out there. And then, you know, the winners w- won the game. They got on the line, demanded all their team got on there and then done the sprints and then they played again. And one player said, well, if the losers the losers are technically getting fitter. Where's so, his uh, well, I, I did it at Watford with the young ones. Uh, I met, it was actually Jaden. That was the first time. I, I don't know why it just come out my mouth. And I remember he won the game, got the team on the line and said, do the sprints. And I think what you're saying there, Sean, about when the top players are seen to be doing it, yeah, kind of down. So Jaden scored on the whistle. He's got all the all his winning team on the line, and they've got to do some sprints. And the loser started to walk over and wanted to join in, and he said, "No, you didn't win." So we just had four rounds of that, and then uh, and then and then from there, it's why is it seen as a punishment? It should be a reward. You're getting fitter. You've got more chance of playing, and then you can mix up the rewards. Like everyone wants free kick training at the end. Well. Well, only the winners can do it. And I think what you'll do, you'll really spice up the training and really get it competitive. Uh, I'm not saying it'll work for everyone. It, again, it comes down to what Sean and, and, um, and they were saying about you've got to really sell it to the players, sell it first. Mm-hmm. But it's a nice little spin. It does work if, if, if you sell it right. Where, what I was going to ask is, is that um, no one's working here as a, as a first team manager or as a head coach within their area so in terms of challenges and we're talking about you know developing the individual within that team environment so ultimately the the, obviously the first team manager wants results so where where have you come up with um and i'll put this to to sean and mike to begin with is where, where do you come up with problems with that you know when you're trying to um do work with players and you know you you have some issues in terms with with the first team manager 
Do you want to go? Come on, at least. <laughs> I mean, to be honest with you, that, that was that was the sort of the biggest challenge when I first came into the club was that it's something that they'd never done before, um, and they'd always had this process like Mike's. It was just they, if they would train as a team all week, and then when it came to the game, the squad was the squad and lads that were left out. They just they just run them after the game, and so. The previous uh, fitness coach had his theories about that and that was kind of, felt like it was a bit like set in stone. So it all, for me, it was a godsend that that fitness coach left and Mike came in because we'd obviously worked together a lot in Dubai with players that we worked with and then we kind of sold the work that we'd done and we were able to show him the work that we'd done with other players and it was big name players so that kind of helped with the buy into it as well. And then we kind of started off as a small process. So what we did first was we worked with the rehab players or players that were coming back from injury and we showed him the types of sessions that we could do and how it was beneficial for them to work with us before they came back and work with the first team. So we showed him the types of drills, types of returns we'd get from it um, and how that could marry up with you know, the data that Mike uses, like he talked about the intensive and the extensive. So we had to sell it to him in that way, really. It was kind of, not show off, but kind of say, oh, we've worked with these sort of players and done this sort of stuff. And these are the lads who've played in the Premier League and won the Champions League. Um, and then show him you know, bit by bit with the players where we could. And then now it's just become part of our staple week. So it's like, these are the players that are playing in the squad. These lads are doing the extra with Sean and Mike, you know, when the game's finished or the day after the game or whenever we do those sessions. Uh, and with the rehab players still. Um, and we have a point now where, you know, some players have struggled with injuries and recurring injuries. So Mike will monitor them and it might be during the week that we want them to do the intensive work. But we want it to do it in a more controlled way so there's no risk of injury. So we might actually pull them out of a session if we're doing small-sided games and I'll take them away and do something that recreates the same intensity but it's more controlled and it's more safe for that player and he trusts us to do that now. So before where we had to fight for it now, he just says, yeah, okay, you take it when you do it. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose the biggest question I get is, you know, if you've seen players doing extra after the training, you know, they all, all they think, oh, they're doing too much but I suppose that's where the data helps and you can sort of sit down and show them oh, actually we need him to do that because, you know, he's low this week on, on that certain type of yeah, data point. So. Yeah. Okay, great. I've just uh, I've just filled some some questions we've had. Uh, Murray Jones has asked clubs of standard training week templates. How do we create environments of cross training activity to develop the whole player across all disciplines, including psych and the social? Um, Cole, I'll put that to you. At United, what do you do there? Uh, well, that's what we were talking about before. What does it look like? The group of everybody who's um, got invested in it has to sit down and say what's it look like so psych's really important so they might do psych at four in the afternoon after we've trained or whatever and some days they might the end of this is uh, great our psychologist they might go and be speaking to him just around the complex because we have them there all day so he's fitting everything in and but making sure everybody gets gets a piece of what they think is important and and then putting it in the right place if you know what i mean it's like he says so it's just like what we said before, and um, we were quite lucky. You mentioned it a minute ago, winning, winning the game at the end of the week. Someone said, when, when you're in the first team environment, winning becomes the most important thing. But even I might be going well against the grain, but I'd still do it like crew. We, we played in the championship, but it was just if you imagine a, the first team now, the first team clubs usually have you could have a 17 year old in there, you could have a Jordan Sancho, Marcus Rashford. Um, so these boys have just arrived at the first team. You can't just then go all there at the first team so the week looks like this. They're in the middle of the development. As a 28-year-old, I was still developing and I needed some help. So I don't think you can just go, ah, oh, now you're at the first team. We, we, the most important is we have a game on a Wednesday, a game on a Saturday, we try to win that game and we don't bother looking for them gaps in the thing where we have to develop the whole play on. We've got to, you've got to find them gaps and if it was for me, it, it, crew, it didn't matter if we lost the way it was in the championship as long as everybody was getting developed all week because they were going to sell a player. And you can't do that at a massive big club like ours or anybody else. We still tried our best to win that game, but it didn't overtake everything else, if you like. And it was weird to be in that environment. It's weird when you tell people that now, but the lifeblood of the club was to improve the players and sell a player. The chairman knew it, the players knew it. Whereas when you go everywhere else, all they cared about was winning the game at the end of the week. No matter how they did it, it could have been horrible, it could have been anything. And like, they'd get over the line sometimes, and sometimes they wouldn't, they might get relegated. Whereas the, the sustainable model of crew seemed much better for me, that players are always going to be sold, players are going to be 
and we stayed in the championship. We did the game prep was usually on a Friday for 15 minutes. You might say Peter Beadry is he put us in our shape. Peter Beadry watching him, he's not gonna cross it here, he'll chop back there. And you got your little game prep, but it didn't overtake the whole player or making a player better. Maybe that was a unique club for doing that, but that's for me is a way I would be thinking that, that really works, especially in development at my age group. You never ever people still think, yeah, you don't want to win. Every player out there wants to win the game as much as anybody else. We're not we're not like thinking, oh, I just have to play well today. They try to win the game, but shouldn't override everything else. That's just my take on it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Um, one for you, Louis. Uh, how do you apply this if the individual is a maverick um, from Matt Carr? Um, I'm not too sure exactly where he means apply this. Is a, but I suppose, how, how do you deal with a player if he is a maverick? How do you deal with him in the team environment? So, I mean, we had this, sorry, Lou, just, um, we were talking to Stephen Taylor on Saturday on the, um, the webinar and he was talking about Ben Arthur at, at Newcastle and mm. Alan Pardew was just, uh, he just said, look, it doesn't matter if he's late, if he, that was how we dealt with him. If he did turn up for training, whatever, if he wins me the game on a Saturday, I'm happy. Um, but whereas obviously different managers see different things. How about you, Louis? Yeah, I, I think it's quite similar. I think it's like, like, especially in academies, football and school, the, the school system, let's, it doesn't cater for everybody. It's just the best way to cater for the mass. And I think it's the same as the academy system. They have to do a syllabus, they have to do, you know, so many things and tick a lot of boxes potentially. But a few individuals could be left out. And I think you've just got to have that degree of flexibility. I mean, there's a great story with the Australian cricket team because Shane Warne apparently wasn't abiding by the rules, wasn't conforming. So the manager just called all the cricketers in and said, look, he's not here. He's disruptive at training. He's uh, not adding value to the training. However, he is the best bowler in the world and we need him. If you, if you want him, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say he doesn't train Monday to Thursday. He'll just come in Friday uh, and then we'll win the game. Or if you, don't, if you don't want him, then I'll just chuck him out of the team. What do you want to do? And it was kind of a show of hands where everyone said, look, he's adding so much value. That's what we're saying. Because he's adding to the team, it's accepted. The problem is, is when they don't start adding to the team and they start removing, and that's when it's not accepted because players have got to work a little bit harder. They've got to cover a little bit of extra ground, but they're not prepared to do it if they're not producing the goods at the other end. Yeah. It is. I mean, is there anything that, that any of you want to ask for one another in terms of see where you're working and the different areas you're working in? Um, I know we've, we've covered quite a, a, I suppose, broad in terms of the detail um, at the first team level, um, all the way down to the detail of working with the younger development players in terms of how you deal with them as, as, as individuals and, um, and players. Um, I've just... A question for Sean. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, it's such a fine line, this one, because, you know, like, say, players want to do a little bit of extra. And it, I don't know, potentially it's the day before the game and the sports scientists are like, oh, you can't really do too much extra. And I, I completely get that from a physical standpoint because there's, you know, they've got a game the next day. But then there's that, what you're gaining uh, physicality, I don't know, by saving the, their legs for not doing the extra work, you could lose 20% mentally. So it might be their routine. It might be, you know, their confidence of hitting those five or six balls. And it's a real... It's a real trade-off. Does it depend on what player's asking you for extra work or is it an all-or-nothing rule? Or No, I think we talk about a lot about everything when, we, when we're doing like conditioning work where it's individual or with players and it's, it's that risk-reward scenario like Mike talks about a lot as well. So I think if a player, like you say, if a player is desperate the day before a game to do some extra finishing who's going to be starting the game, then it's trying to find a bit of a negotiation with him and saying, OK, we're going to let him do it, but you can only have 10 strikes, for example. And we just try and try and negotiate with them a little bit. So we give them something that they want so they don't lose that kind of buzz, that pre-game buzz, if you like. Because every, every player is different, as we know, and they all like to do cert certain things to prepare for a game. So yeah. we just try and make them understand why. We might restrict them on certain days and explain to them the reasons for doing it. But then, like I said, just try and have some kind of balance with them where we give them a little and they give us a little back. I think with a with type of drill, you know, if they want to go and do a finishing drill, you know, it might just be a quick one touch out your feet and then shoot kind of drill rather than a you know a sprint 
to, you know, sprint to the edge of the box, receive the ball and then shoot. Do you know what I mean? So there's ways of adapting it and, and tailor making it. So, you know, then it might not be physically that demanding, but they're still getting what they want from a, yeah, from yeah. a kind of tactical point of view. It's just, it's just about adapting it really. Uh, Mr. Gavin Donahue, how are you, Gavin? Um, Gav worked for Shabab Al Ali out here. Um, he's put, at what, at what age do you think is old enough to make a decision on a player, good enough or not? Gav used to be at Sunderland. I think you got told early on that he was uh, not good enough. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. Yeah, we, we can answer that if you want for Gav. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Someone should have told you when you were 12, Gav. <laughs> He's done, a, done very well to Gavin. But uh, I'll put that to, well, he's asked for Colin and Louis. I'll start with Colin. Well, they're in an age, is they? You know, um, it's opinion. And I, I got told I wasn't good enough. So when, and, and in that era, it was, it was literally an opinion, wasn't it? And I just think the game's changed so much now. I was speaking to a coach just before I come on here. The game's changed so much. Like some people go, oh, no, he can't edit. I was, I was, just, I was look, We had a webinar with the club the other day and I was centre half, but we'll have to let him go. He can't edit. And then John Terry's put a quote out there that for the first uh, 15 years of his career, he headed it 100 times in training a day, 150 times in a game because the goal kicks were just launched. And, and, and he said towards the last three years of his career, he hardly ever headed the ball. He said every, every goal kick was short. He said mostly I was practising playing out patterns defending 1v1s people don't cross it as much because it's not more it's not like a cross that Alan Shearer would score from or Dean Dean Ashton because it, it's hopeful you don't just put it in the box you try to put a pass into the box for a cutback so it's all about opinions and if you're still stuck in that old old olden day thoughts on what football looks like it doesn't I mean John Stones hardly heads the ball anymore it's more about it, it, mistakes so I think you've got a look at the modern game and have an opinion on it and say, I, I use these three things, like I said before, it's like, he's got to have some athleticism. The three things are athleticism, character and technical ability. They're the three main ones. And if someone isn't so good in one, but he's outstanding in two, you usually can get away with it. But if he's outstanding in absolutely world-class in one and not so good in two, you might still get away with it. But if he isn't ticking it all three of them boxes, you can possibly say, you know, and you're talking like the level we're at, they've got to be really outstanding in maybe two, you know, you're like looking at Scholesy, we were talking about Scholesy the other day, not really athletic, not, not, but he had a great character because he was like, had asthma and he was small in the group, and it, and it, but he was also technically supreme, so there's two of the three, but you know, and he was fantastic, but if you're not ticking two or three of them, you sit down as a group and you give your opinion, and you might always fight for someone, you know, I've fought for people. You might not have gone on and be players, but I thought, no, I, I really like his character or I really like his, his technical ability. I'm more swayed by the technical ability all the time. I, I just love the technical players and sometimes I get really swayed by that and I want to keep them in the building, even if they haven't got as much athleticism. And, and sometimes they might help the other players get through because they're really good technically and they're good in training and that. So them kind of things... Influences the coach, don't they? They certainly do, um, and, and we're all different in our views. So um, that's from club to club as well. I know, like with Gav saying that, then the decision is, I suppose, is different from um, individual to individual. Um, Louis, yeah. just just quickly. I mean, I've just um, so I've some. I've, <clears throat> Um, I know there's, there's a number of questions. Steve Law, we'll answer some of those questions you've, you've uh, given on the sports science side. When we do, we'll, we'll bring my, probably Michael or some, some other guys in as well and just do a, a sports science session. Um, so we'll get back to you on them. I know there's a, there's a few other questions I'm just going through now. Um, it, Louis, just going back to that, um, with the players that you worked with at Watford, um, you know, what, 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 was it eight under-14s you worked with or under-15s? It was under it was under fourteens, fifteens, and sixteens. But I think I think when a player plays in their own age group, they've got to be outstanding to be to to be at the level. And then you kind of you think, oh, they might be a player, they might not be. If they play up an age group, they need to be good. And if they play up two age groups, they've just got to survive uh, because obviously you know different ages and puberty and stuff. But I remember Jaden when he was thirteen. And it was in the summer, we had a reduced programme because everyone's gone on holiday and we had 12 to 16s together. 
and he was just streaks ahead of everyone and all he had to do was survive and even against 16 year olds I, I call them like time travelers they just have the ability to freeze time you know that if their second is everybody else's minute and I'm a firm believer that the brain trumps everything and I remember for my pro license I did a study on Mavericks so I spoke to coaches that work with Mavericks players that played with Mavericks and the last tier was Mavericks themselves and I remember talking to a guy called Alberto Capellas and he he really planted a seed with me and he I said to him how did you produce Lionel Messi and obviously Lionel Messi was going to make it regardless but he said we made sure he was surrounded by the most intelligent players and I said what do you mean he said well in England potentially you you surround players who have a strong influence on the game and that could be through physicality whereas in Spain they went for intelligence and he said when he plays for Barcelona there's a high level of intelligence around him that's why he produces but when he plays for Argentina does the level of intelligence drop? And then he started, this is what he said. He said, England have produced world-class players. Michael Owen, Beckham, Scholes, Ferdinand, Lampard, Gerrard. There's, there's so many. But when they play for the clubs, he was saying, is the level of intelligence around them really high? But when they get together, does it reduce? Now, I'm not saying it does or it doesn't, but I just thought it was a really interesting twist. So I'm, I'm a big believer that the brain trumps everything. Can I, can I jump in there on, on that, Louis, as well? Because of course, yeah. Absolutely spot on. Um, the really obvious ones, and there's been many who's come through our club at the moment. I know Watford are renowned for brilliant um, academy and Nick, Nick's at our place now, Nick Cox. And yeah, he's fantastic. When you've got the ones who are two or three years up in the group and it's not because they're physically better, they're the ones that are quite obvious and it's like, well, you've got a good chance of being a player. But we've got two who's just got in the team now who wasn't the top of the group, but the middle of the group, all the way through the system. And if you'd have asked any of us coaches at any time, you'd go, have they got a chance? Yeah, they've got a chance, but, you know, they're not the top of the group. And they're in our first team now and playing. And they're the ones that, like, the guys ask the question that you're like, they're not as obvious. They're, they're in there because of the character. They're in there because they're decent players, but they've not played up. They've played in their own group and they've only been in the middle of the group all the way through. And, so it's a, it's a minefield, if you like, and totally agree with you on it. It's, it's them three things I said before are so important. What are, what are the outstanding qualities? The ones that are, the ones that are dead obvious are like, wow, yeah, you know, he's going to be all right. You can tell, you know, uh, even Jordan is like smashing it two years above. We've had players like that and they did in our first team as well. But the ones that are, that are just under the radar, if you like, they're the ones you have to be careful on. It could be really... I think it comes back to the person again. It's like my yeah. son is six. Um, but, you know, and my daughter's four. My, my son is, hasn't got that drive yet. I don't know if he'll get it. I don't know. But my daughter's four and she's kind of competing with him all the time. But they, they're trying to do shoelaces. She'll just sit there for hours trying to do shoelaces because she's got that desire in her that she just wants to achieve. She wants to do it where my son hasn't. And I think if you add up every single minute of every day of every year that those two players were under the radar... But that, that burn inside of him, that belief and that courage and that ambition, eventually you add up all those minutes, it just takes over. It just comes in. So I think, I, I think you know, a lot of clubs will just do recruiting. I remember I was at Watford. It might be a crazy idea, it might not. But I remember I said, look, when trialists come in, you know, if we've got our own philosophy and there's 92 clubs, surely that's 92 different philosophies. But if this guy puts the ball in the top corner, all 92 philosophies will want him. But actually, all 92 philosophies are different. So I said, well, if we're truly invested in the person, why don't we set up a speed dating night? So when the kid comes in, all the trialists go around the table. Chris's job is to find out as much as he can about this kid's home life. Your job is to find out about as much as his school. You know, my job is to find out about, I know, his football, his favourite player. And when these trialists go around, we'll all come together at the end. And we've seen 20 trialists, two minutes each. We have a bit more of an education on the person that we're looking to get in. Because it's like a school class. We've all been in school. If the good dynamics in the class, if this one kid comes in, he can ruin the whole dynamics for everyone. And I remember um, Les Miserables, uh, the FA, did a great talk with, I can't remember his name, Chris, someone. He was the producer of Les Mis. And he needed a, a leading role. So he interviewed 10 people. And after the first interview, he knew three of them were good enough talent-wise. But he had 10 separate interviews each, with each one, so that's 30, to find out about their personality. So he took each one for a night out and got them drunk because he wanted to see if they like a beer and what they can handle and all that. 
then an, then an, uh, like went to the theatre, then they went for a round of golf, just a coffee shop, Nando's. He met them in 10 different environments because he didn't want to bring in the wrong personality, which would potentially ruin other 33 staff. I thought that was really interesting about the person. It's good. It's very good. Um, just a quick one. I think we're, we're dropping, there's a few people dropping out now, um, but obviously we've, we've been on for over an hour and 20 now. Um, Paul's put, uh, psych social attributes, um, i.e. communication, character, etc., uh, have been identified as important components throughout the webinar for players to possess. So as coaches, how do you develop these? Which, which I think is a great one because, you know, leading on from the, the three webinars we've done previously, um, you know, two, well, all three are of players who have played, you know, more or less the highest level in terms of Premier League um, and we talked around the, the, the psych side, the mental side, that being the, the really the, the, the most important um, factor in, in playing at that top level. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy, obviously, but it's, you, you can see it's tangible to be able to develop someone's technique. Um, from, it's, it's, it's to, from a physical perspective, you can put this in place. But how do you actually, like the, the character of a player, how do you develop that? How do you improve that? Especially when you don't get the buy-in from young players, players who are foreign players, Louis, who works overseas. Um, like how, do you, how, do you, how do you improve that? Sean, you've worked with some, the, the best players in the Premiership obviously on, on, on different occasions and not in a maybe a club environment. But um, from what you've seen with those players, what do you take and now put into um, the players that you're working with at AIK? I think, you know, like you mentioned, a lot of the big players, if you look at, you know, like Van Dijk, for example, if you look at Seb Larsen with us now, our, our call Ben Sig Dawson. For me, that psychological side, you know, we can talk and there are a lot of seminars and talk about how we can create the environment and how we can sit and talk to the player and feed ideas into them. And, you know, but for me, personally, I think a lot of it, or the majority of it comes from the player themselves. I think the top players are top players because they're mentally very strong. Uh, they're very focused on what, they, on what they want to achieve and they'll do anything to get there. And for me, it's like... You know, like you said, you can you can develop the technical area, you can de develop the tactical area of a player, and of course, we'll help young players in in terms of the psychological side, how to get over barriers that they might face, and and this and that kind of thing. But the experience from the top top big players, it comes, I think, it comes from within. It's just uh, this mental strength that they've developed, you know, as a youngster that comes from inside, and that they just want to achieve the best they possibly can, uh, and they'll do everything they can to achieve it. Yeah, um, I mean it's quite it's, it's a really interesting one. We've got Lee Hendry on on Saturday, and we were, you know the, we're talking about talent, and and that comes into into that. I, I believe is that obviously there's so many talent. We've all played with extremely talented footballers that um, could arguably be technically as good as Premier League footballers, but the difference obviously is that is the mental side. So where does that come from? Is it your environment that you're brought up in? You know, if you're brought up in a in a, a bit of a rough house environment, and you need to get out of that environment. Um, is it that you've been brought up within a football family, for example, like Lee? Lee has his uncle, his dad played professional football. So, to try to get those viewpoints would be um, would be interesting because that side, that that probably corner, um, is I would say the least explored um, in terms of psych, social, and um, the most important, arguably. Um, is that a talent? Is that Chris? Pardon? Do you not think that's a talent because? I heard a great quote the other day. It was like, let's be the best at everything that requires no talent. And I said, what do you mean? It's like, yeah, be on time, be punctual. But why is that not perceived as a talent? You know, like we always talk about, uh, you hear stories of James Milner and Henderson, how they're punctual, they're, they're honest, they're hardworking. Why is, but we just see the talent on the pitch. We don't see the talent in the person. So mm. it's a fine line. I think, and that's why I was going back to recruitment. It's all about, it doesn't matter if you're a football coach or whatever industry you work. It's always, in my opinion, about people. People first. Mm. So realistically, you're saying that you know if you if you find out that they've at uh, an early age that they've got this talent, um, oh. that they've got this resilience, this grit, this um, that they've got a chance. So you can develop those other corners. You can you, if they've got that, 
I can then go as a coach and I can develop their technique. I can develop them physically. I can develop them tactically so them to play. So there's a, he's got a chance. You, the lads you've got at United, for example, Colin, like yeah. if they haven't got that, that part, which you can't really put in, which arguably, you know, you, you'll try and develop. But if they haven't got that, then you can forget them. Is that, is that the case? Well, you're talking about profiling them and all the top clubs do it now with the young players and, and so sure. And they'll give you a, you see, cognitive test even, and that's why I'm talking about character before. So it's very, very difficult to get rid of someone. There's been some ones at United. I won't name any names in the past. High-profile players who, you, you know, there was one the other day that was supposed to be worth 100 million pounds or whatever. You'd have seen it quoted. But no matter what you could do, you couldn't really get through to him if you like. I wasn't one of the coaches, or and it wasn't. What you're doing is you're profiling them, saying, look bit of a problem here, character-wise or whatever it is, and I wasn't being bothered, I don't know how true it was, I'm just saying it was in the papers. So you say there's a problem, and uh, but he's absolutely brilliant at this, and absolutely brilliant at this. That's so hard to, to let him go, because everybody, even when you do let him go, someone goes, I'll take a chance on him, I'll have a go at him, and you know, that you're talking about everybody thinks they're the guy that can help him and change him, but I put it all back down to, again, the modern game has changed so much. If, um, I think Louis alluding to it all the time, and certainly I do. If you haven't got a relationship with the modern person now, you, you can just give up. You, you've got no chance with them anyway. You know, and I'm talking about the modern players like Jordan and the young guys who are coming off the estates and all these people. You have to be able to relate to everyone, whether it's coming from a five million pound house, and because you're you, you're the coach, and whether it be in the first team. I mean, there's a quote John Terry said the other day, and I, I wrote it. it was, uh, we didn't get too much coaching individually or collectively in the 90s and the in the 2000s. You just trained. You trained like what I said before and played. And the older players give you the ramen in, the coaches give you loads of grief. And that was accepted. It's nothing like that anymore in, in any way, shape or form. If the players aren't happy with it, they'll go. They've got agents. The manager doesn't rule the roost anymore. He can't say to him, told the line, no, I'm going to do this. You, you know, that you see this. The public spats on the news. If a player wants out, he goes. If you play, it was different in our era, and there was nothing wrong with our era. I played in it; it was great. You were in fear of the manager. You were in fear of anybody in authority. You're not in fear of the coaches now. You're not in fear of the manager. You have to be able to communicate with him in a, so that they can respect you. And I'm sure Louis was alluding into it before. And the lads are. If they don't want to do any extra, you can't say to them, "Do you want to do any extra?" And they go, "No." I mean. You just don't have the respect to say, well, actually, you try to help me, Colin, and I'm going to do extra with you. And if you've got a bad apple or a bad egg, and you do sometimes, and it's happened in the occasions, and you think that's going to take the affect the others, and it's people are going to see it, well, you have to deal with it in some kind of way because the days are gone where you can scream and shout at them and send them in and do all that thing. So it's really important. That's why I'm alluding to before character, what you're saying, uh, the mentality and that. But you're right, if you've got some people who are just... Uh, wrongings if you like there's not much you can do if they're already in the building apart from apart from like get them an exit strategy because you know that's it <laughs> <laughs> that's, why I'm a, that's why I'm a big admirer of Gareth Southgate because you're right I don't think you can rule by the iron fist anymore because the players will just sit back they have the power the players can get rid of you now whereas Gareth Southgate has showed like a, a, a bit of humility he's come across as a person you know and I think people really respect that and I think they'll work harder for you it's like, um, again, like, you know, we, we've all been taught by school teachers, but we've all got a favourite teacher. And, but they all hold the same level of qualification. And what separates them is the way we connect. It's all about, I, I'm a big believer, it's all about connection. There's a coach out there that has never delivered a session in their life who's better than all of us right now. Because if they can connect with this person and we can't, they, they hold the key. And what, what China do is really well, I agree with that, Louis, but you're then missing the next bit out. So there's a teacher out there who's like the best teacher in the world, but he doesn't know the details to help teach. Yeah. teach. I got to I, first base. <laughs> I remember Dario and Steve. Steve will never yeah. shot anyone in his life, Steve Holland, who's his assistant, but he had amazing detail and was that's part of the problem of being the next player. You don't know how to teach. So you just think you're going to be a good coach, but you don't know how to teach. And it's, it's not true. The best coaches are usually teachers, and then they've learned the details. And what, what players have to do is they might know the details a bit better because 
do it in high level games and the details are, are there, but then they don't know how to teach it. So somewhere along them lines, it's an amalgamation of things you said, Lou, brilliant. There's one, there's one really good thing on that, that China do. Which is yeah. so China. Yeah, go on, sorry, Luke, go on, yeah. China obviously dominate the world of table tennis. I, th I think it's something like if, if the world if the world champion outside China wouldn't get in the top 500 Chinese players. But what they do really well in China is if you're at a club level, say, and you get elected to play for your county district or the, the national team, the player goes to the national team and their coach. Because the coach is the one that has the connection with the player. If you take if you leave the coach at home and just take the player to the national team, this player could be completely different. They've got no relationship, no rapport. How can this guy talk to this guy? So they just take the coach as well, and it's more, it's easier. Because it could be they've got a great relationship, or it could be the national coach says, oh, Colin, can you tell him to do this, and I just go through you? Because yeah. if the player goes, they won't have that connection. I found that really interesting. I've, I mean, I've, I've been told at Barcelona that at each age group they have coming through, they have a, an academic um, and then they have a, a, an ex-player. Um, and I, I don't know whether this is still true. This was something I was told a few years back by John Griffiths at the FA that we his study done on them. Um, and they, they cannot have, there's not one, obviously you think that the, the ex-Barcelona player would, be, um, would have, you know, the, be the first team. They are level. So the academic, the, the, the teacher... And the player um, support one another, and obviously, you know, the player. I do that through for them. I think Ajax do that. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, well. this is. I mean, we've gone, we've gone kind of full circle here in terms of talking about the talent of a coach, really, haven't we? Um, which is a, which is another session. I mean, we've been on. It's great that we've still got. I mean, we've still got eighty-five people on online, here, so we could go for quite a while. But you recognise. Because we play all them in tournaments all over with Ajax, Barcelona all the time in, in the past. And it's just recognising that they're an expert at whatever age group they are. In England, it's such a rush to say, I get up to the first team, that means I'm a really good coach. Whereas at Ajax, you see the same coaches at the 14s for years and years. And he's paid highly because he's an expert at that age group. He understands the needs of the player at that age group. He understands the tactical side of it. Not, what, what does that look like? It's not all 11 aside, it's individual work. I think that's what other countries do better than us, whereas in England it's still a bit of a mad rush to get up to the to the first team because that's where the money is, if you like, and all them kind of things. Whereas if you're an expert, you're an expert at an age group, you're an expert at it. I think we tried to do that at United as well. We've got some people who stayed with the younger groups for years and years because they, they're highly valued and they know what they're doing down there. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Um, it, Dylan's just put yes, yeah, so do it, youth and senior phase. Um, apologies, everyone. I know there's a lot of questions. I will try and see if we can um, answer them off offline. Um, but we've, you know, we've gone over an hour and a half now, so I'm just worried that she um, let the lads go. But really enjoyed this evening. Um, just to let you know, I mean, if you could, like I say, if we could just reinforce that um, for people's time and stuff, if you can, if you've enjoyed it this evening, if you can put, push that out on social media and if you can. Um, obviously, just let your network know that we've this Saturday at 3 p.m. UK time. We've got Lee Hendry talking about talent, talk about Henders, to, you know how, how he was brought through the system, and obviously first on the scene with Villa. Um, and then the following week, we've got Richard Walker um, and Gareth Owen from Stoke. Uh, uh, Rich is a 23s lead. Gareth is the academy director, um, so it'd be interesting to see what they're doing at Stoke. Um, and then after that, we have Dean Ashton, um, so which will be a great insight into his career. Uh, just talking about him, his career, and also obviously how it finished early, and you know where he could have gone, and his feelings um, after after that. Really, so um, we've got some really really good guests coming up, um, and I'd just like to thank everyone for joining us, um, and particularly obviously Mike, Sean. Louis and Cole this evening. Thanks, thanks very much, chaps. Cheers, mate. Uh, yeah, cheers. 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 Take care. Cheers. See you, boys.